All right, for those of you just joining us, welcome to the 24 hours of STEM energy live stream. My name is Alex, I'm from team 1073, the force team, and this is... Evan, hello. Also from the force team 1073. All right, well, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Grant Perkins. I am a now alum of FRC Team 190. I am WPI class of 2024, and I'm a WPI Live developer. And when my fellows join, they will introduce themselves to. Oh, uh, OK. I'm uh, uh, Brad Miller, and um, uh, I've been doing WPI Live since, um, well, since there was one, since 2009, with the introduction of the C Rio. And, uh, and, and today, we're going to talk about machine learning. And, and then uh, next, Austin. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Austin Shallot. Uh, I am a WPI uh, senior at the moment. And um, I do a lot of work on WPI lib with the tooling and developer operations um, and have also been helping out on the machine learning front. And Frank? I'm uh, Frank Grossman. I've uh, one of the founding members of uh, Team 1073, so super appreciate everything they're doing here. And uh, been uh, I'm also now director of all the first programs in New Hampshire, and uh, work with the WPI folk uh, mostly on the machine learning parts. Okay, uh, so I guess I'm a, I'm going to lead off here. Um, so I'm going to I'll just share my screen so you can see that I have some some uh, slides and to be able to see uh, what those look like. So hang on one second while I do that. And then I'll kick off the presentation. Okay, can everyone see that? Looks good? Yeah. So we're, um, uh, so what we're gonna talk about today is uh, machine learning and some of the things that are coming up uh, for first and some some opportunities to do a little bit more with computer vision than, than um, than you're currently, you know, probably currently doing with your uh, robots, and um, and okay, so we've already everybody's already introduced themselves, so we'll kind of uh, skip this, and and get onto the agenda, and the plan is to talk, do a little bit of a high level overview about machine learning, some uh, background about machine learning, some of the goals that we have for the project, some of the people we're partnering with, uh, to to talk a little bit about you know how how this could be a little bit easier for you to use yourselves some of the solutions, uh, some of the parts of the solutions, the pieces in the process for the solution that we have. And then we're actually gonna demonstrate it live. So live demonstrations are always dangerous, but we're gonna do a live demonstration of, um, uh, of doing machine learning. So you can see what it's like to, to train and, um, and, and see it operating. And, and then we'll be able to entertain questions as we go. So um, I guess if, if anybody has questions, um, or if questions come up, if you want to just interrupt and, and, and tell us what they are, then, then go for it. Um, and, and we'll just, you know, instead of waiting till the end so we can capture stuff in the moment. Um, I'm, I'm going to start out and I'm going to talk a little bit about the current state of uh, computer vision with FRC. And this is actually uh, the way it's been for quite a while, where, where I guess it started a long time ago with computer vision, where, uh, where there were these uh, cold cathode uh, tubes that would it would be like underneath a target, target, and then people would have um, like a, a CMU cam, this like forty-five dollar camera that had a um, little microprocessor in it, and it would be able to identify the green light from the cold cathode tubes, and then first put some of those into the kit. Um, and that was the very beginning of being able to identify targets. I think in two thousand six, uh, I remember uh, shooting balls into one of those targets um, uh, with the with the light right underneath it. That was pretty cool. Uh, but then it got a little bit more sophisticated when the Robo Rio came on the scene, or the C Rio came on the scene, and um, and then we started using uh, uh, NI Vision. National Instruments had a uh, vision library, and and people started using that and doing and then just plugging in a, a regular camera into their robot, so a, a USB camera or something, or there would be a, a Wi-Fi camera that would send stuff back, and uh, and you'd be able to do recognition using the NI stuff. Um, a little while later, we kind of switched to using um, uh, for, to OpenCV from NI Vision, and and OpenCV is a is a uh, uh, software library 
that's used by most researchers for computer vision. It's probably the most popular computer, open computer vision library that's in use these days. And uh, it's, it's pretty easy to use. Uh, we've done a lot of work to make it even easier to use. We'll talk a little bit about some of that stuff. And, um, and now you can run it right on your RoboRio if you want, or uh, you can use a coprocessor. So what, what people are kind of currently doing, or I think the current state of, of computer vision in FRC is that you stick a Raspberry Pi or, or equivalent, you know, so a Raspberry Pi or a Limelight camera or something like that, you know, that on your robot that, that runs OpenCV inside of it. And, uh, and then it's connected to the robot network. So that means that the RoboRio can see it and your driver station can see it. And um, it, it does the computation on there. It does all the, it, it, it looks at the images. It tries to figure out where things are, the targets like the retroreflective tape and stuff. And, uh, um, and, and, then it, and, then, and then it sends you information, the coordinates of where the interesting parts of the field are, you know, things that you, that you want your robot to be able to identify, mostly goals that you want to shoot balls into or frisbees or something. And so that's kind of how, um, how stuff works. The reason for the Raspberry Pi is because a lot of these uh, computer vision algorithms can get kind of CPU intensive. And, um, and, and so they were, they were kind of swamping the, uh, the Robo or the Robo Rio a little bit, especially the C Rio. And then even with the Robo Rio, they were a little bit too, uh, uh, they were kind of swamping it. It was a little bit too much. And so uh, the idea was that we kind of standardized in the Raspberry Pi as a coprocessor. And, and in fact, there's stuff in WPI Lab, you may have used it, um, this FRC Vision stuff, where, where uh, we supply an image for the Raspberry Pi. You can just load it right on. You can deploy stuff to the Raspberry Pi directly. Um, there's more of that coming out um, in the coming year. Uh, we're doing more work in that area. But the idea is that you just, the, the thing is just running on the separate processor and it's off of the Robo Rio and not loading it down. So it doesn't impact the performance of your robot program at all. And, and that's sort of the plan. Um, some people um, actually went beyond that and they're using even more powerful like GPU based processors like the NVIDIA, NVIDIA Jetson. And some of these things really draw a lot of current. I mean, you know, like there are a lot of power uh, to operate this. I mean, they're very, very fast. They're they're, the boards are designed specifically for doing um, computer vision and, um, uh, and, and activities like that. Uh, and, and, and so they're very, they're, they're very uh, power hungry, but very fast. And, uh, and, they, and so they let you do all this off-board processing. Fortunately for all the stuff for FRC, all we're trying to do is identify rectangles with uh, retroreflective tape and uh, and it's pretty easy, so it doesn't need a lot of uh, horsepower uh, usually. And and so for those sorts of applications, the Raspberry Pi is just fine, and and it works okay. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of the state of the art and what people are are doing these days. Um, so we're typically using these retroreflective tape cues, and so you can see a picture here with with some retroreflective tape around some interesting parts of the field. You know things that you might want to identify. Um, uh, uh, and, and so, so that's, that's the, that's in, in, in that illustration. Um, and then the other thing that we started doing, I think, I think I started doing this like five years ago or something or four years ago, uh, in conjunction with first with, um, uh, uh, with, with, with Kevin, um, from first the FRC software engineer, what we, what we ended up doing was going out on the field before the kickoff. And then we would take a whole bunch of sample photos uh, with lots of, with, of all the targets from lots of angles and lots of distances. Um, and if you look at these, what, what you kind of see going on here is um, uh, on, the, on those bottom pictures is if you turn the sensitivity way down on the camera, but then you put a ring light uh, around the lens on the, on the camera, it lights it up. It lights up the retroreflective tape with the color of the ring light. I mean, that retro. The idea of retroreflective tape is that it reflects the light back directly back to wherever it came from. So even if you're off angle, uh, normally if you're off angle, you get this, you know, angle of incidence, angle of reflection kind of, you know, stuff from physics. But with retroreflective tape, it reflects it back in the same direction it came from. So if you put the ring light around the camera 
uh, and then you turn down the sensitivity and the ring light's kind of bright and they're really getting bright these days. I mean, like, like blinding bright, sometimes not even legal bright. Um, they, uh, it just lights up. And so you can see in these pictures that, that all you see is the, is the retro, retroflective tape targets. And, um, and, and so it's not too hard to, to sense that stuff, you know, to detect that with uh, an open CV program. So, so that's not bad. Um, and, and so that's kind of how you set up the camera and what you'd see. But as, we're, as we've been moving forward and as the technology is advancing, um, processes are getting faster, uh, prices of stuff are going down, uh, then, then you, know, you kind of start looking at like the real world and what's like really happening. And, and it's kind of interesting. So in the real world, uh, most things you want to detect don't have retroreflective tape around them. I mean, it's really nice on a robot field, um, but if you want to detect people or dogs or, you know, or bicycles or things like that, generally you can't get those guys to wrap themselves in retroreflective tape. And, um, and so it's kind of hard to use these techniques for doing it. So you'd like to have a solution that a little bit more, um, uh, okay, wait, I should say reflects what's going on in the real world, you know, that, that, um, that, that represents the way that you would really do this, you know, if you really wanted to detect stuff. So while the retroflective tape stuff is really good for FRC, it doesn't really, um, it, it's really not letting you learn about how you would do this for real when people aren't making it easy. Now, as I say this, um, and, and this happened last time because we were giving this, we gave a talk like this uh, uh, a little while ago. Um, it, I was reminded, or it came to me that uh, highway signs, which cars wanted to take. I have a car that can, you know, can can follow the lane lines on the road, and um, and and it, and it occurred to me that the uh, lane lines on the road, those are retroflective. They're retroflective paint that they use, and that's why they light up. So if you hit, if you're driving along and there's a big road sign on the highway, and you hit it with your uh, headlights, you know, it just turns green. It's like really bright at night, and that's because it's retroflective paint. I mean, it works the same way as the retroflective tape. But everything else does not have retroflective tape. So, so uh, except for that, um, it works. So, um, so, and you also might decide that your strategy, you know, the winning strategy that you want to use in a first competition is not just looking for the things which have tape around it on the field, but you may want to look for other things. Like you may want to look for balls, you know, game pieces that, that are laying on the floor that don't have tape on them. And, and, um, and some of those things may be complicated to recognize. So, you know, if you want to look at one of these, uh, you know, hash panel covers, these things may be, you know, kind of hard to see, you know, it's just kind of almost a circle with some white stuff and some yellow stuff and, you know, and, and, you know, it's got some numbers on it. You may be able to recognize this, but coming up with an algorithm that does that may not be so easy. So, so what you what we're really looking for is a different way of doing it, you know, learn a new, looking for a new way of doing this that makes it a little bit, um, uh, more real world like and more robust so you can have more robust solutions and um, uh, and as and as as the games get more complicated or your programs get more complicated you know you may have more complicated objects so uh, just using OpenCV to try and figure out how to write some algorithm to text this stuff starts getting complicated and you know so it, it makes me a while ago well okay so a long while ago um, when I when I uh, so I got out of so, I, so I, I, was, I got out of college, I was working. And one of the things I got interested in, uh, and this was, you know, like kind of back when computers were being invented or something, was, um, was, was chess. Uh, I played chess, I was in a chess club. Um, and, and, and I was kind of, in, and I was doing computers, you know, I was doing a software engineer. And so it seemed like the thing to do is to write um, a program to play chess and get the computer to do it. And, and, and so that was, so that kind of was interesting, you know, the idea of using um, writing computer program to play chess. And in fact, I actually showed up with a computer. I mean, the computer was like way big, you know, you had to plug it in and it was on a cart and stuff like that. And it had this external like typewriter thing. And, uh, you know, so you could, so you can put in the moves and it would give you back the moves that the opponent had. It wasn't like running on a, on a cell phone or something. And, um, uh, and, and, and so I had this chess program that I wrote and I, was, I entered it in the chess tournament, it was kind of funny. And, and it did okay, but it wasn't nearly as good as like the good chess players. Although some of the players uh, complained, they were comparing it with like uh, trying to enter a weightlifting competition against a forklift. 
you know, or something where it's, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's not fair, but at the time chess programs weren't that good. And, uh, and people would, you know, people who were halfway decent would easily beat the program. But that changed um, back in 1997, uh, you know, IBM had um, this computer called Deep Blue and, um, and, and this chess program with it that, that was much, much more complicated uh, than my program. And the computer was way, way faster than the computer that I had. I mean, you know, like 20 years before that or something. And um, um, so, so, but the algorithm that I used when I was writing the program, which is fundamentally the same kind of algorithm that Deep Blue uses, is it does this look ahead search thing. So, so basically what it does is it says, for, you know, it looks at the board and it says, oh, I've got like 20 moves I can make. And it says, if I make the first move, then what will the opponent do? And then it looks at their 20 moves and then, then it makes their move and then, and then it makes another move and then it makes the opponent's move. And it goes down some number of levels deep. And when it gets down as deep as it wants to look, then it evaluates the board position and it assigns it a score. And then it sends the board positions back up this kind of tree you know, for all these moves, you know, my moves, the opponent's moves, my moves, the opponent's moves, you know, all the way back up through all the levels and for all the moves. And, and, you know, there were ways of making that go faster and the algorithms were kind of complicated that would prune the tree and not have, you didn't have to look at all this stuff. But basically it was kind of a complex problem of, of being able to come up with a good board evaluation and uh, in this algorithm and all these optimizations to make it, you know, run reasonably fast. And so it could look deeper and all that stuff. So that was, that was like kind of how things were. But in 1997, Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov, who was the former world chess champion. And in there, there's Gary there in the, in the bottom right, not too happy about losing to the computer. Um, so enter uh, machine learning, okay? And, and what's happening, and this is, and machine learning is like kind of interesting. It's like all the rage, this is what's going on. Um, uh, what happens is, here's Deep Blue. Uh, the way the program works is you give it a board position. It's got a bunch of rules. It cranks through this, you know, kind of what you could maybe call traditional artificial intelligence. It does these algorithms called like a minimax search and uh, with alpha beta pruning and words like that. And um, so it takes that stuff and it comes up with a board evaluation for each move. And then it picks the one that's got the best evaluation. Okay, and that's pretty nice. But the difference is, um, the difference is that and recently Google uh, has this uh, has this uh, computer and algorithm called DeepMind uh, Alpha Zero. What they did was by using machine learning, which worked, it kind of flips this, uh, uh, kind of inverts this a little bit. You put in board positions and you put in the evaluation. So you put in um, uh, the scores for all the you know for for all these board positions, like whether they're winning or losing board positions, and then the machine learning algorithm figures out the rules. Okay, so, so in the case of my program, I would put in a board position, I would have a ton of code that represented the rules, all these heuristics and logic and all that kind of stuff. It would give me an evaluation. With, with DeepMind uh, Alpha Zero, what you do is you put in the board positions and you tell it the evaluations and then it figures out the rules. And in fact, really what was happening was they were putting in board positions and the, and the thing was figuring out, the, it was totally figuring out the rules by itself. So that in, in a few hours, they were able to just let the thing go. They put in the rules for the game, just how chess was played, like, you know, which way knights move and which way rooks move and queens and kings and en passant and all that stuff. They put in the rules for the game. They just let it rip, um, playing out positions and, and, and all the way out to the end and scoring them. And it trained itself. I mean, it just learned how to do it. It figured out what the rules were for... Uh, uh, for evaluating board positions. And, uh, and, and that was great. I mean, that was like a huge breakthrough using machine learning uh, for, for doing things like chess. And then you'd say, well, yeah, but the robots aren't playing chess. You know, like, so what does this have to do with robots? And so if we come back and look at this analogy, um, what we're doing, what we do right now is we put in images and then we have the lots of rules, this open CV program that tries to figure out you know, in the case of the retroflective tape making a square, it goes, oh, it's a square. We have to look for squares and they're this size and the aspect ratio should be like, you know, the length, the width should be like this much. And we go, oh, that's a target. And then we send back the coordinates of the target. Okay, but if we take what we learned from chess and apply it to detecting um, uh, these things on the field, what we're doing is we're putting in images 
And we're telling the algorithm, the machine learning algorithm, what those images represent. So for all the images, we inside of the image, we say, oh, this is a ball, this is a goal, this is something else. You know, we just label all of these things. And then the machine learning algorithm infers the rules. It figures out how, what images look like. I mean, what balls look like and what game pieces, you know, different game pieces look like and what field elements look like. And, and it learn, it creates the rules. And once you got the rules, then, um, then you can just detect stuff without all these complicated algorithms. And, and so that's, that's sort of what machine learning is. And that's where AI is now. AI is just, has shifted since since computers got so much faster and these algorithms got so much better, all of artificial intelligence kind of shifted from those old traditional algorithms to now using machine learning, and uh, and it happened fast, you know, like in the last, you know, five or ten years. Um, so so here's an example of of machine learning. So this is like like a like a car like mine or or other you know cars might do. Uh, this is what they're seeing. There there there's a camera. Uh, maybe lots of maybe other sensors besides the camera. They're looking out in front. They're identifying things using these machine learning algorithms because they've been trained to recognize cars and trucks and, and lane lines and stop signs and traffic lights. And, uh, and, and so it's just reporting back all of these things that it's finding in the images and it's doing it really fast, you know, fast enough so that you can do it at driving speed. And, and so that's, that's sort of how this stuff works. So machine learning is, is our algorithms that let computers learn from data and then makes decisions based on that data. Um, and so the idea is that teams could potentially identify any objects on the field. They don't have to be the things that first decided to label. And, um, and, and the learning is based on high quality training data. So you go around and you take all these pictures uh, of good quality, maybe within different lighting, uh, you know, things like that, different lighting, different situations. You label all of those, the algorithm kind of figures it out um, by, by looking at all of those, the algorithm gets trained and we'll talk about how that training works in a little bit. Uh, and, and you get this like very, very uh, kind of real world solution that's like tolerant of lighting conditions. It, it works at different angles because you've trained it for things at different angles. And, and now we can just figure it out. And, and that's really where we want to get. We'd like to get so that you can just pick things you want on the field and you can go look for those and have, excuse me, have your robot just drive right to them. Um, so the goal of this project that we have going is to give first students the kind of the skills you really want in the future. Okay, machine learning is where it's at. That's the up and coming technology. We want people, students to get experience with machine learning because that's, that's what they'll want to know about. Um, and it enhances the gameplay, like for autonomous and teleop for audience. I mean, you know, you, you can now, maybe you can now start tracking movable pieces. There's less lighting problems. Maybe you can use signs and shapes instead of retroreflective tape. So you can have a picture with words on it or, you know, a, a sign with chevrons that point to where the robot's supposed to go, you know, or something like that. And, and these machine learning algorithms can see that because they've been trained to recognize those kinds of things. And, and so teams now can create their own you know, kind of, and the other goal of the project is that teams can create their own competitive solution. So they can um, uh, uh, create a solution that, that differentiates themselves for what maybe what other teams do uh, and, and have something that's pretty cool. And the idea is that, that um, we want this to be usable in a short amount of time. What happens is, you know, come January, when, when there's a kickoff, you, you get the game. I mean, that's the first time you know what the game is. It's the first time you know what the game pieces are. And then you have a very short amount of time, like six or seven or eight weeks, maybe like eight weeks or something before your first competition. And, and so you got to get this all working. So what we're trying to do is make this, you can kind of get into this easily. Um, uh, and and so, so we're doing stuff to make this so that it's easy for you to get going with machine learning. But at the same time, there's a lot of headroom for teams that want to do more. And we'll talk about how that works. Some of the, you'll see some of the tools that we're talking about uh, providing and, and how, that, how that whole thing works. And we want this to be affordable. Um, like we said, the, these machine learning algorithms uh, are very, very CPU intensive. I mean, more than just using the computer vision stuff that we did before. Um, so, you, so some teams may have computers with GPUs in them, you know, like gaming computers that are really fast. But other teams may not have those resources. And so one of our goals was to make that 
so that uh, make this all work so that you can use it regardless of the resources that you have. And we'll talk about that. And we want this to work for um, uh, FRC for sure, starting out and, and, then, and then applying this maybe to FTC. In fact, FTC has been doing some machine learning stuff for, for years, for a few years now. Um, um, but we're, we're trying to advance towards the stuff being much more general purpose. So to solve the affordable problem uh, and, and people having a shortage of you know, very, very fast computers to do this training locally, we're, we've got some partners. Um, so we're partnering with Google and we're partnering with, um, uh, with AWS, Amazon um, Web Services, and, and they have fast computers and they're in the cloud. And the idea is that we wanna make those available to you so that if you can't do the training locally, you can do it in the cloud. So everybody sort of has a level playing field. So nobody is being, um, uh, no, nobody is, 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 is unable to have high performance solutions because they don't have a fast computer. And, and then another group that we're partnering with is called uh, Supervisely. And, uh, and, so, and you'll see an example of that or, or demo of that a little bit later. But a supervisory is a platform for uh, storing all of your images and labeling them so that then you can use that to train your uh, machine learning algorithms. And, uh, and, and, and first is all on board and uh, WPI, uh, the WPI live team is, is working on this and, and that this is you know, some, of the, some of the team that's speaking here today. So, so that's kind of an interesting you know, mix of, uh, of, of people to try and make this really work for you. Um, so the pieces of the solution, the things that we've got are supervisory. Uh, we talked about that. That's a website. It's a labeling platform. So you can upload all your images to that. And, um, and then you can label those. And label, what labeling means is you go find all the interesting things in the pictures and you draw boxes around them. And uh, those boxes get stored. The, the locations of those boxes get stored in some parallel files alongside the images. So that when you do the training, it, it can know what it's it, it can know which things are the balls and which things are the frisbees and you know all that stuff, um, and uh, um, so we, and and we want te we want teams to be able to do this if PCs are available. Um, but like I said, we have uh, cloud-based stuff which will be available for uh, uh, making this a little bit more equitable across all of the teams, and. Um, and and our target platform again is the Raspberry Pi uh, microprocessor. Um, which is pretty inexpensive. They're like $35. Um, but since these are such um, uh, uh, compute intensive algorithms that are running, there's another device um, that you can get called a Google Coral. Uh, it's a TensorFlow processing unit. Uh, TensorFlow is the name of a Google algorithm for doing machine learning. And it plugs into a USB port on the Raspberry Pi and it increases the performance of the Raspberry Pi detecting images for maybe uh, a few frames per second to like 30 frames per second. So it kind of runs at real time. And so the solution kind of looks like this. You acquire images um, and we will provide images before the at, at the start of the season. You label the images, you do this training, and then, and then you, you take the model, you stick it onto your Raspberry Pi and you do what's called inference which is where your robot can detect the objects in the images, in the video that the cameras are seeing. And with that, uh, I think I talked way too long, but I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Frank and he's gonna do a little bit more in depth, uh, uh, a little bit more in depth information about how this stuff really works and some of the terminology and things to kind of let you understand the literature a little bit better. So Frank, you are on. All right. Um... <clears throat> So yeah, a lot of terminology, whenever you're learning something new, there, there's always a, a, a new set of terminology and sort of using uh, uh, an analogy here of um, what's being called programming 2.0 and how that sort of analyzes to what we do today. So if you think today, and I'll use Java as an example, um, you would bring up an IDE um, and, and write some code in there. You might have some tools that help you with that. Um, and then when you're done, you would go ahead and compile that. Um, during the compile process, it might tell you about some syntax errors you made or, or uh, other problems that it can detect. Um, and then finally, you end up with, um, with, with, and I use Java for a reason, you end up with actually a, a, a file that's bytecode. And that bytecode can run on any machine that has a virtual machine running on it. So it's, it's sort of independent of the hardware. Um, 
and, and can run that way. And if we look at the programming 2.0, um, we can see an analogy. So the writing the code, there's actually things that are pretty close to an IDE to help you label your data. And that, that terminology will make more sense uh, as, as we get into it and get into the demo. But um, you're basically taking uh, the images that, that we have of the field and labeling the important things uh, to your team. And that way, uh, that's your programming of what that you want this to detect. And then we go through a, a, a training of the neural network. Um, we'll go back. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, that, that uh, training of the neural network is very similar to a compile um, process where uh, it, it's going through and, and learning all that information that you told it to. And then finally, when you want to go run the program, what we end up with the trained ne neural network is we end up with a network in a file that can be actually placed anywhere that you can run uh, inference. And inference is basically running the, the neural network. So it's similar to running the program. Um, let's go ahead. Um, so so the, the uh, image acquisition, um, and this has a few builds on it, uh, Brad. The, 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 one of the things we will do um, is go ahead and uh, as we did this year, we'll go through and we'll take a whole bunch of pictures of the field and the objects on the field uh, before kickoff uh, so that we can provide that um, for you so that it's very easy to uh, get started day one um, of, of kickoff that will have this set of images to you. And we will actually probably label some of the images, but it'll be more likely we'll provide 10,000 images and we'll only label 3,000 of like we did this one, uh, you know, the, the, the power cells, but we won't do everything, right? So the idea is that a team should go in if they want uh, to, to get better detection uh, of uh, power cells. They may want to label more pictures. Um, they may want to see the goals. They may want to, uh, you know, different things. So it's sort of up to the team to go ahead and do that as, as part of the process. And um, then it'll be brought what we put it in again, we, we're working with Supervisely. Um, and that's, again, sort of like your IDE. Um, it allows you uh, the tools to, uh, to label um, and uh, give, give each of the items you're interested um, a bounding box and then a, uh, a label of what it is. Um, so uh, that'll be uh, set up for you and we'll demo that, but uh, very easy. And there's different types of labeling. Um, that can be done. Uh, we're using bounding boxes here because that's really enough information. Uh, but there is a method for polygons uh, that you can do that is um, exactly the shape. And one of the advantages of that is uh, if it's on a stable thing like the goal, um, you can then actually tell the angle you're at based on the shape of the polygon images. Um, so that that could be done in a more intense way, but it could give you a lot more information and and something to, to think about. Um, on the next slide. Um, so companies like Tesla now spend more time with their data than they do with their um, with their programming. Um, so it's 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 becoming quite a process, and it's coming something that's uh, pretty important to learn because it's uh, uh, there's whole careers out there of, of knowing how to uh, label data and and. Uh, theories of that and everything else. So getting, getting your hands and getting a little try at it is, is pretty important. Um, terminology wise, when you label something on a image, it's called the ground truth. Um, and so the ground truth is something you've said, this is what it is. And then that is up to the uh, uh, program and the training to use that. And usually when you build your, your data sets, uh, uh, you'll go ahead and uh, um, you'll break it into training sets and evaluation sets. So when a, a neural network is being trained, it will use all your training ones, but then it has to tell how well it's doing and it will go to your evaluation set. Um, and you want to pick those um, wisely for, for the things we're going to be doing, uh, like power cells, it's, it's not as critical. So we just say, use 85% for your training and the rest for your evaluation. But if you're somebody like uh, Tesla, um, 
you want to make sure there's things in the valuation set that are important. So, um, you know, there's people that uh, may have um, uh, gone to a concert and uh, slapped the sticker from their concert on a uh, stop sign. Um, now that stop sign looks a little different. You want to make sure you can uh, see those kind of things or, or there's stop signs that uh, look like stop signs, but also say in the bottom, a little arrow off to the right might say, uh, except if you're turning right. So if you want a car to run automatically, you really don't want it to uh, stop when it's turning right. So there's a lot to do. So in here, I've got a couple examples, like you might have uh, all your cars, a bunch of different types of cars, and now you've got your, your, your data set, you know, evaluating cars real well, and you might have done bicycles, and you got yourself uh, doing really well. And then all of a sudden you're uh, going down 70 miles an hour down the highway and screech, your, your car puts on its brakes because it thinks there's a bike crossing the road, right? Um, this is not good. Um, so there's a lot to this data science and doing this. Now, luckily Tesla does this really cool thing which it calls shadow mode. And it will, um, each time it's done a new set of learning, it uploads it to its million vehicles out there, but doesn't have it do anything. It just acts like it's doing. So in a case like this, um, the data set might say, I just slammed on the brakes, but you know what, the driver didn't do anything. And it'll then take a copy of those images and a little bit of uh, data from what the car and the driver was doing and send that back to uh, headquarters. And then they can uh, understand that and, and do it. They actually have algorithms to, to under that because they probably are getting millions of pictures. But, um, but it, it's, it's a really cool way that they can uh, do this data labeling and understand the effects of it before they uh, put anybody in danger. Um, so I'm going to go through um, a little bit here on the training part. The, the, the labeling part is, is, is pretty straightforward. The training part gets a little bit more intense. Um, there's a lot of parts that um, you can learn at a pretty good depth, um, which is, is really fun, um, especially if you're uh, the kind that likes to investigate how things work or, or uh, are very into math. There's a lot of good uh, math that's in these parts. Um, but uh, I think it's good for everybody to always understand what's happening underneath what, when they're doing a step of, of a, a process with software. So I want to go into it a, a little bit. Um, so next slide, we'll talk about the um, types of, of machine learning. And there's, when you're training, there's sort of uh, three main types. Um, supervised is what we're talking about here. I labeled some data. Um, and I want to use it for object detection, so I'm going to train my neural network on that trained data for specific information. Um, unsupervised, we are collecting in the world just a, petabytes of, of, of data a day um, that, that, that we always thought would be useful, and then nobody knows what to do with it because it's so much data. If you think about, you know, uh, Target or something, you know, every time somebody uses their little uh, card for a discount, um, it, it keeps track of everything you bought and, and the discounts, and that maybe happens for a million people in a day. And, and somebody said, well, that's cool. Then I can go through and figure out what those million people did. And that was fine until the next day, there's another million, another million, <laughs> and they eventually couldn't keep up with it. So they, they came up with machine learning called ups, unsupervised, um, where you can pack in a lot of data and it looks for trends in that data. And an interesting one that just happened was um, an, a, a company up in Canada um, puts in a ton of medical data and uh, travel data. And it actually said, um, we're seeing a whole bunch of odd cases up in uh, uh, Wuhan uh, territory of, of China uh, of pneumonia. And um, it detected that just from all this data was seeing and seeing an own normal trend. And then it was actually able to say, and we know all the flights that are going out of there. So if you see another plume of this, you know, uh, uh, odd pneumonia, we actually know that it's probably uh, a transmittable disease and it's transmitting around. So this happened a couple weeks before actually any, any stories came out uh, that we were uh, headed towards a pandemic. So uh, that unsupervised data is, is a pretty cool thing. And, and the third type is reinforcement learning, um, where um, you have a procedure that's happening and you want um, sort of as, as Brad was talking about, something to get better and better as it goes along uh, by learning by itself. So if you had, um, let's say for this season, you had a, a shooter uh, for the power cells and it has a, a wheel uh, that's going and maybe a turret and maybe it had a, uh, um, a little shield on the top to, to vary how high um, the, the power cell could go. 
mixing all those three to be able to shoot anywhere on the field uh, within range uh, is, is pretty tough on the programmers. And so there's this thing called reinforcement learning where um, if you had the time, you could uh, do a thousand or 10,000 of these, these uh, shots and you basically uh, give it a award algorithm. So if you knew where that ball went to every single time, uh, it might start with a really low motor speed and it sort of dribbles to the ground and you're like, not much reward there. And as it keeps going and gets towards the target, it gets a higher, higher reward. And it starts learning that it can do that. And as it controls the different pieces, um, it starts learning how to do that. And eventually you could have a shooter that you just say, I just pick up power cell, shoot it, and it'll, it'll figure out how to get it into the goal, top goal every time. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty cool uh, process as well. Um, as Brad talked about, um, a lot of this training is, is pretty intense. Um, so there's these wonderful data centers out there, Amazon, uh, Google, uh, a lot of them out, else out there um, that have all these services. And, and you can say, you know what, I want, you know, uh, 10 CPU units for the next hour and, 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 and buy that. And it's actually pretty cheap. Um, and it turns out there's also uh, different processing units other than just CPUs. There's uh, a graphics processing unit, um, which Brad alluded to, which um, as I get into a moment of how a neural network is trained, um, it uses a lot of math that's uh, known as matrix math or linear algebra, if you've taken a class uh, of that. Um, and, and GPUs are doing exactly that when, when you're watching a video game and it's, it's uh, moving things around and, and, uh, and stuff. That's not a, a program that's moving every six pixel. It's asking the GPU to change its uh, camera vision and it knows how to do that uh, processing. And then Tensor is uh, a really cool um, uh, t TensorFlow, which we've talked, we'll talk about, um, that Google does, is a very specific set of this math, and they built a processor that is tuned to that type of math, so it's even faster uh, to use. So these data centers are, are, are pretty nice. Um, go to the next slide. Um, so this is a, a neural network. Um, this is actually a very simple one. Um, it's got eight inputs and uh, four outputs. So um, you might have been inputting, um, you know, a couple different levels. And what you want to output is, you know, is this a, uh, um, a letter A, a letter B, a letter C, or a letter D? And you'll get in those outputs sort of a, a varying amounts to, to, to know what that is. Um, and then there's these hidden layers in the middle. And those hidden layers, um, there's a, a, a lot more, uh, um, guessing than science when, when neural nets starts of how many uh, you know, layers do you put in the middle and, 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 uh, and what algorithms do you assign to them. And it's getting to be a little bit more of a science, but uh, there was a lot to be learned. Now, the reason I say this is a simple neural network, if, if we were feeding an um, image into here and each one of those input layer, um, layer nodes was a, a pixel, and you took a 640 by 480 uh, uh, image uh, times three, because you've got the RGB to, to make it color, um, that'd be almost a million inputs. So uh, it, it, uh, it, the, the algorithms and, and the neural networks are, are pretty uh, complicated compared to, to this. And what happens is each line there is what is considered uh, in TensorFlow a tensor. So it's like a vector uh, heading to the next node. And then at that node is going to be, what's going to be calculated is what's called a weight. Um, W-E-I-G-H-T, and, 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 and that weight um, will be used during the inference. So you're doing all this training. And each time you tell it something, it's going to go through an algorithm to change those weights. And then when you run it, um, if we thought about this neural net very simply, the first, let's say the first three uh, input nodes there were, um, were all yellow. Um, and it runs through, it might say, hey, you know what, that, that weighting like, is pretty good. That, that could be a power cell. So we're, we're gonna say, we might be seeing a power cell. And then if the, if the fourth one, you know, um, pixel was showing a little bit of curve uh, and you might be able to start seeing this rounded, it's gonna go up. And, that, and that's just by it, it just passing the value of all those pixels through. And, it, and each time it calculates these weights and keeps on going down, it's eventually gonna get to, to what that uh, information is. Um, and so TensorFlow is, is the model we um, are using because it's uh, by Google. Google's partnering with us and it's, it's got some pretty uh, um, cool things. Um, and uh, basically the way you would describe this whole neural network is more in a graph 
Um, so you use some Python and you describe um, a graph of what all these uh, nodes are going to look like. And then you uh, assign an algorithm uh, to each one of those nodes. And, and then that creates the neural network uh, for your training. Um, and, and like I said, they, they've done a lot of work with optimizing these tensors. Um, and it, and it, uh, um, there's other ones out there as well. I mentioned a couple here, and, and I think uh, uh, Grant might mention one later. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a, a few there. So go to the next. Um, so transfer learning is um, when you get a neural network, uh, if you just say, here's a bunch of power cells and, um, and to take it, uh, it wouldn't know what you were talking about because it hasn't figured out what objects are. And, and, my, and my analogy to this is sort of if first time you hear a foreign language, you just hear a bunch of things stretched together and you have to hear it for a long time before you start hearing the spaces between the, uh, um, the words so that you can find uh, words themselves. And it's the same thing with, uh, um, with a neural network. So um, there's actually this thing called a model zoo out there where you can pick different models that have already been pre-trained to understand objects. And then all you're doing is training it to see the, uh, um, the different pieces uh, that you're interested in. Um, so we'll go on to the, the next. Um, I'm trying to speed up a little here. Uh, the, uh, there's a thing called uh, hyperparameters. Um, and these are sort of like uh, compile flags if you were playing with a compiler, but uh, um, you can tell it to do different things. So um, you can tell it how many times you want to train on your data set. And you say, well, what is it once enough? And uh, any of those of you who've been around a, uh, a toddler, uh, the number of times you said, uh, that's a dog, it goes bark, that's a dog, it goes, right. You have to hear it a bunch of times before it, it, it settles into the neural network. And, and so this is very similar with, with this kind of training. So the number of epics is the number of times that it's gone through uh, your data set to train. And the batch is uh, uh, the size of the uh, number of images that it'll do all at once. Um, so if you have more memory and, and uh, um, so if you can do more in a batch, so it can go a little bit faster. And there's actually this whole thing of hyper tuning parameter, hyper parameter tuning that is, is really cool. Uh, AWS has a service where you can say, um, use a whole bunch of CPU units, spin up a whole bunch of trainings and each one modify my hyperparameters just a little bit and uh, find out which one works best. And, and so uh, rather expensive to do, but can really optimize uh, uh, a neural network really fast. Um, when we're looking at the accuracy of uh, that, so when we go through a compile, um, we want to see um, what information we got. Uh, is how well is it doing as far as the training is going? So again, we have that evaluate uh, the training set and the evaluation set. And there's this thing called mean average precision. Um, I think I'm run out of time, so I'll, uh, it's something to really look into is, is mean average precision of, of sort of how do we calculate during that training process how well we're doing. Um, and then that'll bring us to uh, once we have a trained network, um, we could go to what's called inference. An inference again is is the running of it. So we're taking images off a uh, video feed, putting into the network. It's going through and going to give us basically a list of the objects it's detected, what type that object is, how confident it is that that was the object that it said it was, and the bounding box of where that is on the screen. So if you're looking at you know you might see uh, seven power cells and. Uh, um, one's near the, the middle where you were looking for it. So you keep concentrated on that one and you can get that. And, and uh, uh, if we go to the next slide, basically we will, uh, uh, we have a solution that, that uh, um, can be set up very easily and that we have some software for um, so that that gets put into your uh, network table. So this has a Raspberry Pi that's connected to the, uh, the ethernet on your uh, system a Google Coral that Brad mentioned, which is one of these tensor processing units for about $60. So it's really uh, the whole neural net's running out over there. And, and then the uh, Pi is taking in the images, sending it over to the, uh, the Coral, and then gets back that list and that puts it in the network tables so that your uh, RoboRio program can, can use that. And uh, I think That's we it. should- uh, Yeah, so we'll turn it over now to uh, uh, Grant and Austin. I'll, I will stop sharing my screen. And and, uh, and, and Grant will share his screen and show you some of the tools that we've been developing. Uh, so Grant, Austin, go for it. 
Yeah. So we're going to get started with the demo. And to get started, we're going to uh, show the first step of the machine learning pipeline, which is to gather our data and label the images. Uh, so we've already uploaded the images to Supervisely, and we can see them here. And let's hop into one of the data sets to label a image. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the uh, box label tool to click around each power cell. And what we're trying to do here is to make sure that we're just labeling the power cell and not anything else. So for example, in this last power cell, uh, Grant labeled too much. So what will happen there is instead of the algorithm learning what a power cell is, the power cell might learn what a power cell on carpet looks like. Um, now, Supervisely is great because you can go back and just click on the handles to uh, update the labels. So these were some that we did earlier, which I guess we rushed through a little bit. So we're going to uh, go ahead and fix those right on up. That looks pretty good, Grant. And, Thanks. And now we can just keep doing that for as many images we need to train the data set. Um, now, this data set that we're looking at right here uh, was taken before kickoff uh, on the kickoff field. So these images were available at kickoff, which is great to see. Um, so you can get started with machine learning immediately. The next step of the machine learning pipeline is to download the data set from Supervisely. Um, so Grant's going to go ahead and show how we do that. We're going to choose the JSON and images option. And what that means is it's going to download both the images themselves and the labels, the locations of where the power cells are. Now, Sometimes the download can take a while because there's a lot of images. So we actually went ahead and downloaded it earlier. So Grant, if you want to swap over to the tool. So we downloaded the images earlier, the, the data set earlier, and put it in the right spot for the, um, the tool that we're um, developing to make the process a little bit easier. So with this tool, the goal is to be able to train a neural network without needing to install TensorFlow or install a bunch of dependencies. Because what we found when we were developing the pipeline was that was one of the hardest steps, was getting everything set up with the correct dependencies. So what this does is it will let you uh, upload your data set and then select a couple parameters that we've identified as being really important to how accurate the model um, or how accurate or how well the model performs. So on this page, we can set the model name, which is what the output name of the model is going to be, select the data set, and we've selected the one that we downloaded earlier. The next option is the model to retrain. What that is, is we're not going to start training from scratch. We're actually going to pick up where someone left off. So the one that we have selected here is one from the zoo. That's the place that Frank was mentioning earlier. Uh, and it's trained on uh, about 100 different classes of objects. So now that that model already knows kind of how to detect uh, different classes, we can just retrain the last little bit of it to instead of detecting a cell phone, for example, to detect power cells. Uh, in the future, you can apply the same logic to retraining other uh, robotics data sets. So if you have a power cell model already, you can retrain it to um, work in a case that it wasn't quite working very well before. The next option is the number of training steps. This is how many uh, batches we're going to look at of images. So uh, every batch, the batch size is right below it. The batch size is a number of images that we're going to look at at one time. And we're going to execute with these options 5,000 batches of 256 images. So that's quite a lot of images uh, when you multiply it out, uh, which is why machine learning can take so long. Um, the final option on this page is the steps before evaluation. 
what the evaluation does is while it's training, it will actually go and try and run inference on a couple of images so we can see how well the model's performing and if it's actually learning or not. Um, the lower that number is, the longer your training will take, but you'll also get more feedback as it's running. So now we're going to hop over to the monitor because we actually started a training session before um, this presentation started just so we can have some data in there. So right now we're on step 86 out of 5,000. So we still have quite a ways to go, but we wanted to make sure that it didn't finish. Um, on this page, the, the main option or the main view is a graph of uh, different data that we're getting back from the model. So right now we're looking at loss, which is one of the properties we can look at. There are other options there that we'll have documented in the future. Uh, let's take a look at TensorBoard though, Grant. So what TensorBoard does is it really gives us a, oh. I'm trying, I'm clicking on it. <laughs> okay, oh, well, well, on well you figure Zoom it out. Oh, okay, <laughs> Zoom was in the way. Um, so what we're looking at here is we actually get an in-depth look of how the model is training. So we can actually investigate those evaluations that we were talking about earlier. So on this view, what we can see is on for, we can see the evaluation set of the images and we can scroll through every evaluation step to see if the model is in fact learning or not. So on the left-hand side, we have what the model is, uh, thinks is happening. And on the right, we have the ground truth or what we actually labeled. So in that first step, Grant, if you wanna go to sure. like step three, uh, we can see the model can kind of detect power cells. If you look very closely, you can see the percentages, which is uh, the confidence of what it's detecting, of what it sees there, or what it's labeling, is what it says it is. So it's not really sure if those are power cells, but it's okay, pretty sure. Uh, but it also thinks some of the carpet is a power cell. So definitely some things to be desired. But if we let it continue to train, hopefully it will learn more and more what a power cell is. So at this step, it didn't detect all the power cells. And then finally, it's, it's, it starts to uh, really learn what a power cell is. And it does this for a bunch of images. So if you want to scroll down, maybe we can choose another image. That might be interesting. So here we can see the same thing again, where at the beginning, it might not really know what a power cell is. And as it learns, it really, well, it learns because uh, our data set in this case is set up in a way where it's learning. So if you're on a far in the future step and you see that it's still detecting random things, um, you might need to go back and either change some of the parameters that we were discussing earlier, or maybe go and look at your data set to see if some things are mislabeled. Um, and I'm gonna pass it back now to Brad to oh. close out. Okay, uh, I guess we have uh, five more minutes left, is that right? Um, anybody have any questions or anything about what you've seen? For, oh, also I'd like to mention, the stuff that, that um, Austin and Grant were just showing were some prototypes of tools. We're just trying to figure out uh, uh, what things might, you know, how things might work. And, and so we're actually gonna be working on some much more polished versions of those starting, uh, starting actually next week. So, um, um, and, 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 it's, and it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, that's really, that was, that was just trained locally on, uh, on, on, uh, on Grant's computer and, uh, um, and, and so you can kind of see how it works. And it's really cool that you can, as, it, as the algorithm runs, it gets smarter and smarter. You know, it, it, all those nodes are getting all their um, uh, constants uh, adjusted. And, and so that stuff that um, Frank was talking about is, is happening for each iteration uh, of the training, each step of the training. And, you, and like, like uh, Austin was saying, you can see it keeps getting smarter and smarter and better and better able to you know, identify, in this case, the power cells. And so that's sort of what it's all about. And, and, and the idea is you let it run and, and, and look at the uh, accuracy curve and figure out uh, um, at what point you wanna cut it off. But we have a question. Oh, from Austin Shu. What type of um, 
uh, augmentations are you looking at? Grant, Austin, you guys want to? Perhaps uh, I'm not familiar Aust with this vocabulary. <laughs> Austin, do you mean like data set augmentations? If you want to yeah, type a I clarification. So I'll just answer assuming you mean data set augmentations. And if we get a clarification, then we'll, um, we'll talk about that. Um, so this data set that we're that we trained with today to produce this output uh, had no augmentations on it. Um, were yes, okay, good. So yeah, this data set had no augmentations in it except for um, each batch. So we didn't run it for long enough, but each batch, the order that the or each epoch the order of the images that the algorithm was looking at was randomized um, that is definitely something that we're going to be looking into in the future but um, we're just we're not there yet um, as part of the pipeline hope that answers hey, your thanks question so, thanks Austin. Austin. any other questions so I have a question from within our team. Um, it's a little off topic, but there were a lot of great improvements to WPI Lib um, in 2020 from both a functional and software design standpoint. Um, are you able to comment on new features and improvements to WPI Lib that we, we can look forward to in 2021? Sure. Go ahead. Okay, so the, the team is working on, on a lot of different things right now. Um, and there's quite a lot of us. So just to kind of give the highlights, uh, we have a, a couple different working groups right now. Um, one of them is looking at um, really improving the simulation interface for uh, robots. So uh, if you're a team and you want to, like you're a programmer on a team and you know that you're designing a robot that's going to have a elevator or an arm or some other kind of mechanism that um, you know that you won't be able to see for seven weeks or the night before the competition. And then you're going to be handed the robot and, um, and you'll have to program it in an hour or two. Uh, that can be really hard and really stressful. So what we're, we're looking at, and we've kind of had this uh, functionality built in for a while, but it, it's been hard to use is um, different ways of simulating the robot. So if you ask the robot to drive for five seconds to move off of the starting line or whatever it's called the, the next year, if that's one of the uh, challenges, I, I forget what it was this year, um, then we can create a way for you to actually run your robot code on your laptop to see the robot move off the starting line. Um, so that's one of the things that the group is working on. Another thing that the group is working on is we have a team of people that are trying to translate the documentation. So uh, we have documentation, for those of you who have not seen it before, docs.wpilib.org. Um, and we have a group of people trying to translate the documentation into different languages to really make sure um, we're being as accessible as possible all over the world. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, we have Jason from Google as our next presenter. Um, thank you to everyone for this presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you.